Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. My name is Claudia Krawiecka. I'm a CBT cybersecurity student at the University of Oxford. I work on introducing novel behavioral biometric system based on naturally occurring interactions with uh, objects in smart environments, in Internet of Things environments and augmented reality environments. So looking at profiling people based on how they interact with devices around them. The biometric that I propose leverages existing sensors to both identify and authenticate users without requiring any hardware modification of existing smart home devices. It also doesn't require any specific gestures, just interact with uh, environment the system is designed to reduce the need for phone-based authentication on which current smart home systems rely. I conducted a real-world experiment that involved 38 participants in both a smart office environment and a private smart household. And I used this experiment to, you know, not only collect the data for identification purposes, but also to study mimicry attacks. What's interesting about this novel, it operates in three modes. So the first uses only the sensors embedded in devices that the user interacts with. Uh, another mode is of objects for which it only uses collocated sensors, so sensors on nearby devices. Lastly, it operates in combined mode that is a mixture of both. So that's in a nutshell what I'm working on currently. Could you just explain a little bit uh, what authentication is. The system can perform both identification and authentication. Identification is when we try to classify users into different user groups, profiles, I would say, because this is individual profile per person. So can the system recognize whether it's mother or father or a child interacting with the object? Authentication is do they get permission to actually operate certain devices, for instance, making financial transactions which should not be available to children. And the system them after identifying who is currently uh, interacting should make this decision. That's the distinction between these two things I, I'm looking at. Authentication, who can do what, and identification, whether I'm recognizing the specific entity in the environment. What is it that you're curious about? These days, we have really lots of different smart devices on the market. We have plenty of vendors. And first of all, one of the things that's really annoying about setting up your own environment is the cross-platform interaction or lack thereof. Each of the devices from different vendors will have different apps and, and you will operate these devices through apps. So you will authenticate very differently to each of them. And it's a lot of hassle to actually use that, to use all of this securely. There is also a problem with permissions then because you have cross-app interaction. Operation on one device may be permitting something on another device from another vendor. It gets a bit tricky. I'm very curious of trying to uh, develop a method that will work for all and we'll look at usability aspects. Why do we want to think about usability? Why is that important to you? Asking people for passwords, pin codes, or making specific gestures, it's always hassle for a user. So what I'm proposing and you know what I'm looking at here is can we make it more usable, more natural for the user to authenticate, to identify devices to the environment. That's why I started doing this research. I was actually really curious, can we make it usable for the user? We have a lot of amazing security platforms and systems and tools, but users are just not able to use them. So can we do something that will be easy to use and will be used by, by the users? There's so much you know, good research, but it's just unusable. That's my motivation. And that's where my curiosity lies. I'm curious, actually, how over the last few years, your ideas around what usability means have changed as you've gone through all of these challenges and dealt with all of these practical problems. I come from a very applied engineering, software engineering background. Until my master's research, usability wasn't something I was really thinking about. I was like, okay, if I develop the system, it works, it has amazing backends, fine. I was working on securing password databases on the cloud servers. I was collaborating with Intel. It was a new technology at the time. It was hardware-based 
protection. And the other part of this research was how do we convey to users which platforms are using our solution. We came up with this web browser plugin that will uh, connect and, and perform something called remote attestation with the server and just verify whether the server is running the secure part that will protect the pass. For this study, we have almost 100 users coming to our office trying to use the plugin to spot whether the uh, website is actually using our solution or is just trying to convince them that it's using our solution, so phishing attacks. We ask users afterwards, so, so what do you think about the solution? Would you use the solution? And, and you know, many many people actually understood what it's doing. Uh, many people said it's very interesting project, very easy to use. Some of them also said, you know, I don't have that many things to protect. And once you follow up with them and you ask, what about your medical records, bank details, then they start thinking about this, how inconvenient the password usage for them and the fact that they reuse it across different platforms. They say it's a lot of new things to learn and it doesn't seem to seem less for them. It seems that's something they would have to spend time on reading and, and researching. And that's why they don't think that they would transition into using something else. So then I realize that things have to happen in the background. It has to be seamless. It has to be easy to use something very intuitive because otherwise we will waste the potential of amazing systems we have. In the end, we are doing this for users, not for engineers. This is why this aspect became interesting to me. Yeah, security just shouldn't get in the way. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's the thing. It shouldn't get in the way. It should be there. It should be there for a user, right? Because that's what we want. We want to protect people and their data. What's the biggest challenge in your research and how have you approached it? Let's go back to uh, end of 2019, maybe beginning of 2020. When you do any research that connects to users and requires them to come to the lab so you can gather samples, it became very tricky in pandemic. The biggest challenge in my PhD research was actually how to reach the users remotely, how to reach them in their own houses. If you invite them to lab, it's an artificial setting. So this is behavioral biometric. The principles of this are that people behave naturally, which in lab they will not. With pandemic and also this knowledge that we want to, you know, gather uh, realistic samples, I came up with an idea, why don't we develop a remote test bed? For, uh, for the participants. So we developed this plug and play experimentation set that we will be sending to people private households. They can connect all the smart devices. They will get an instruction how to do it, two to three pages, video, how to do it. And, and we decided to progress this way. You have different aspects. You need to consider the safety of that. If there are some wires, people can trip in their own houses. When it's happening uh, on the premises of the university, we can be insured, but once it's happening outside of it, what do we do? We came up with the whole new remote experimentation framework. The system was called Plug and Play, a framework for remote experimentation in uh, cybersecurity. The biggest challenge that I have actually resulted in a very interesting research problem. It allowed us also to reach people we normally couldn't reach, like people with disabilities, for instance, that couldn't come to the lab. This was the biggest challenge, but it was also, in a way, a blessing, uh, because then you started thinking about all the other aspects and how to address them. I can give you very specific examples. The first testing household we send the devices to. In some cases, we ask the participants to stick devices to surfaces like cupboards, somewhere where they would, in the future, put the smart device. We send them stickers. But once the devices got hot because of all the processing they were doing, they were falling off the walls. This was some, something we didn't think of earlier. It was the first test household, but also, you know, we wanted to collect data from them as well because, you know, cost of shipping and, and cost of, you know, doing all the procedures. So, so we, we, we actually couldn't. We failed because the devices were falling down and then people didn't place them in the same place. For us, it was important that all the users will have the exact same position of these devices and, and placement. And then you get the data, you look at them and you're like, there's some, fortunately, we asked them for pictures of the setup and we noticed that on different days, they were in different places. So when we asked why they said, oh, they were actually falling down, so we had to put them somewhere else. We, we had to discard that data. What has been the biggest surprise in your research? Huh, that's a really good question. Tied to the issue of pandemic and inability to work with people directly is how the process of experimentation and, and, you know, doing something out of the typical frame can be challenging. Because when we are developing this methodology, we had to wait for approvals for several months because it has to go through all the safety committees that can delay your research. 
I'm just surprised to see there is no solution for, for problems like this. There are no guidelines. I'm, I'm very proud. This is not a very technical paper, but it's one of the proudest achievements. It starts the discussion on maybe we should improve the methods of experimentation. We should improve the formal procedures and, and take into account safety of participants and researchers. You need to be able to experiment with the user where they are. Depending on your research work, you may take it outside the lab. Because in certain cases, simulations are, are not reflective of natural behavior. I was just surprised there was no formal method of dealing with outside of premises experimentation. You want to collect natural behavioral samples from users and having that in the artificial it's, lab, it's not representative of your actual behavior. And all the biases you are introducing comes from the fact that people behave very differently depending on, on where they are. Are they familiar with the space? Is someone observing them? Because in the lab, they would be on the best behavior, right? Which is, again, not what they would do in, in, in their own time, in their own environment. What I learned during my PhD is that you can do all these amazing experiments, can collect all the data, but in the end, they may not represent what is actually happening. And I think we always talk about the usability of systems to end users, but there's also usability in terms of, of, you know, like how you experiment with users. And if you're going to give them the flexibility to, you know, organize the test, but in a way they want to do it, how to make it usable, how to make it experimentation friendly for the users as well, not only the system. There is a bigger issue of, of making systems and interfaces uh, usable. So this is not the main thing I look at in my research, but this is certainly something that I pay attention to and I discuss in every paper I write now. My, my supervisor is actually laughing that uh, I'm, I'm this usability person in, in our group because I always think about that whenever we design experiments. I think it's important. This is something I believe we, we, we all should look at. My group is very technical. We, we all are from very technical uh, computer science, applied software engineering background. So, so it's easy with this group of people to not think about these aspects. Then again, if you have smart devices, a lot of distributed devices, or you have wearable devices, which are part of Internet of Things environment, this is something that people interact on a daily basis. And there are ways to do something that will help them, will secure these devices or the environment they are in or the data without interfering with the daily schedules or, or asking them uh, to understand something on a very deep technical level. You've mentioned two different kinds of attacks so far. Phishing attacks I'm fairly familiar with. We don't click on links and emails because it might take you somewhere you're not meant to go. And so it might put viruses on your machine. But I don't know about mimicry attacks. Can you tell us a bit more about what they are and how that relates to your work? Okay, mimicry attacks are mimicking attacks. So the attacker tries to mimic the behavior, the gestures, depending on, on, on the character of the biometric system, of the victim, of the person who has the privileges to either execute financial transactions or any access to data. In these groups of attack, you will be looking at measuring how how well your system defends the user, protects the user from other person coming and, and basically trying to perform the same gestures, the same interactions as the user does. To be more specific, in my work, I, I look at two kinds of this attack. I mean, it's still the same attack in both. The, the attacker will mimic the victim, but the observation period is slightly different. So two flavors of this attack that I discuss, it's a video-based uh, attack and another one is in-person observation attack. So video-based is, uh, we assume that the attacker had a video footage, someone recorded for the attacker or in some way the attacker got access to a video recording of the local camera, for instance, when the user was interacting with the smart environment, smart devices. And then we allowed our participants uh, who are attackers, who are in the attacking group, to watch the video and then try to mimic the behavior of the of the victim um, they saw on the on the video footage. In person observation, let's imagine smart office environment. You have a lot of colleagues, but you have a manager who can do certain things you can't, or uh, you want access to smart printer history of another user. So you are a malicious colleague. So you want to use the privileges of someone else. You can easily follow the person because it won't be that uh, suspicious uh, in this case. You, you may be, I don't know, in the kitchen or next to printer as well. So, but you can actually observe for quite some time how the person interacts, how much force they put into the interaction. 
some of our participants looked at the, the time the person took to interact with cer- certain devices or the strength, the speed of certain interaction types. Mimicry attacks will be the attacks in which the attacker just tried to simulate the behavior of the victim to pull the system. What were some of your findings about which strategies for mimicry attacks tended to be more successful versus ones that tended to be less successful in the study that you just mentioned? We found out in the Smart Office study that the video-based attacks were pretty successful. They could observe the victim for a very long time and they could replay the recording. What plays a key role here is the time of observation. And the system is still pretty robust because it also utilizes collocated objects. So the nearby objects, which will correct for certain decisions the system makes. What I'm saying, it's more difficult to several um, sensors and devices. In person, they could observe the victim from different angles. That contributed. They have the flexibility of observing victims from different perspectives that video-based attackers didn't. But the key factor was the time of observation, tying to how successful uh, the, the attacks were. What was the experiment? What did you collect? So there were two types of experiments. One was just a general interaction in the private household. So we sent a bunch of devices. People placed the devices wherever they wanted. They had instructions how to power it off correctly. We sent them a mobile device providing access point to the internet. So we are sending the data to our research group server. We collect them in real time so we could provide quick feedback to participants. So we asked everyone to do 20 interactions per device. We gave them flexibility to do it over a day, over a few days. Majority of them chose to do it the same day. In my future work, what I will be interested to see is how the behavior changes over time, uh, eventually. The smart office environment, so that's the attack scenario. There was uh, one or two employees setting things up, and we asked everyone to do 20 rounds of experiment individually to have some sort of a baseline behavior to see if they are not trying to mimic the user, can they still fool the system? They were divided randomly into two groups, one victim chosen randomly, and the rest of the 12 participants, six in each group, were either in in person, so they could observe the victim, or getting a, a footage of the victim. When you say devices, what kind of device was it that people were interacting with? We needed good resolution of the sensor data, right? So we needed good something frequency. The only vendor that could give us smart things, yet not the resolution we hope for. So we analyzed what are the most common sensors. We identified most popular sensors, accelerometers, gyroscopes, and microphones. We attached them to Raspberry Pi devices, like a small computer, emulating the smart device. We did a lot of soldering and all the fun parts. <laughs> the in-person observation, can you just sort of explain a little bit how that worked? They decided to set up uh, the experiment in the office kitchen. We asked the victim once again to do her 20 runs, so other participants participants can watch it from the in-person group. We invited one by one. They could observe how the person interacted with every device, how she moved her hand, how she walked, and other things. So each of them got uh, to observe one full round uh, of her interaction. Attackers were not allowed to speak. They were not allowed to interfere with the victim doing her operation. Knowing what you know now, and if you had unlimited resources, what specific problem would you use those resources towards solving? Two years ago, uh, what we looked at was a a preliminary authentication method for uh, augmented reality environment with unlimited resources, taking into account metaverse coming up, people moving their services, people moving certain uh, social interactions to virtual environments. This is something what I actually would like to focus on, to look deeper into. How can we authenticate? How can we ensure the security of users in that environment or while they are using virtual reality or augmented reality glasses? A lot of what I'm doing right now for Internet of Things devices can be sort of mapped to the techniques used in augmented reality environments, so how you interact with 3D objects. That's what we worked on two years ago. It's not just looking at what we've got. It's also thinking about new ideas, what's coming up, new ways that attackers might try and either pretend to be people or steal people's gestures or steal their identities. How would you bring creativity into this kind of work? There are a few points you can look at securing many points for virtual environments. One of would, would be biometrics of your interactions with the object, so, so continuous authentication method. Is the person use, using the glasses currently? Because now you have to imagine that you wear the glasses for, let's say, half of the day. You share the glasses with your partner, and then they can access all your 
data, they potentially can see something you saw earlier in the day. That seems like a huge privacy concern. And we have to make sure that the glasses are able to recognize the user, especially because this is still very expensive technology. So it will be shared, uh, at least in the beginning. There is huge potential in, in looking at that and, and trying to solve this problem, uh, how to protect users from internal threat, family members, for instance, or people they share equipment with. These things are with you the whole time. They record you, right? It's not only smartwatch. Of course, having a smartwatch, you can also tell where the person was, what activities they were doing. There's plenty of things you can infer from that. But VR, AR glasses, you'll have plenty of different types of data that can be misused. Creativity should focus on, on securing that. Another thing is when they compromise the interface. Let's say you are driving the car and suddenly you have a commercial popping up in front of your eyes, obscuring your view, and, and you are causing an accident. This is another area that people discuss right now. What are the sort of safety implications of that? There is a lot of creativity to be brought into a virtual environment because there are many things that can go wrong. I'm wondering if you've thought about using that environment to make users more aware of areas where they might be vulnerable to attacks such as mimicry attacks. We will live in the in, in, in very interesting time zone uh, that you have all the smart devices around you and at the top of it you have wearables or augmented reality or virtual reality glasses. Yeah, that could be also used, for instance, to record the person performing certain interactions on the devices then and uh, using the interface to guide you. So this is very interesting. This, people should start looking at this. I may start looking at this. There was a paper a few years ago on a person actually using the glasses to record someone typing the password on the keyboard in the cafe. They, they could infer what the person is typing. It's something we should think about, recognizing whether users are performing certain critical uh, operations or maybe they are in areas the glasses shouldn't enable recordings, like bathrooms, for instance, public bathrooms. Many other things to think about, and I think it's really cool. Do you have any tips for keeping up to speed with cybersecurity? Yes, absolutely. One thing I, I find it really useful is the mailing list called uh, security at uh, fossa.org. All the interesting talks, interesting research in, in security, uh, different topics, uh, machine learning, uh, IoT, all of these things people discuss on this mailing list. There are invitations to summer schools, to workshops, to reading groups. So uh, all the researchers that are, or, or people interested in just, you know, keeping up with with, uh, with the conferences, the papers, talks, I, I should highly recommend signing up to this mailing list. Just before we go, I'd like to ask, do you have anything on your plate at the moment? Is there anything we can tell our listeners about? I'm co-organizing um, uh, this a research session at the largest European Women in Tech Summit that will happen in, in Warsaw, Poland. It's called Perspective Women in Tech Summit. Uh, it's really exciting because it's in Poland, in my own country. There is a huge cybersecurity community coming up, setting meetings, mentoring sessions, cybersecurity researchers. Mm. There will be cybersecurity organizations. This is free of charge event. We have a lot of scholarships for students and researchers to attend the hybrid conference, so you can attend online. So I think it's a very interesting place to meet like-minded people. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.